during my presentation today, I will briefly go through basics of um, serum protein electrophoresis, uh, monoclonal gammopathies, and few clinical and laboratory guidelines. I will mainly discuss the interpretation of common serum protein electrophoresis patterns, then quantification and reporting of monoclonal proteins, including co-migrating monoclonal proteins and small bands. If time permits, we will go through a few um, case studies. In general, electrophoresis is a separation technique based on movement of charged particles in a liquid medium under the influence of an external electrical field. Electrophoretic migration depends on the size, shape, and net charge of the molecule, as well as the properties of the electrophoretic system, such as pH, pH and ionic strength of the buffer, temperature of the support medium, and the voltage applied. Common methods are gel-based electrophoresis and capillary zone electrophoresis. There are differences between these two methods, but I'm not going to discuss those in detail during today's presentation. The main role of protein electrophoresis is to detect monoclonal proteins associated with monoclonal gammopathies. Quantification and reporting of normal protein fractions can provide the clinician with additional information beyond the presence or absence of a monoclonal protein. Before going into details of serum protein electrophoresis interpretation, we will briefly go through a few important points related to monoclonal gammopathies. Monoclonal gammopathies are a group of disorders characterized by the pro proliferation of a single clone of plasma cells. They produce an immunologically homogeneous protein, commonly referred to as a paraprotein or monoclonal protein. There are different categories of monoclonal proteins. As you know, monoclonal gammopathy of uncertain significance or small ring multiple myeloma or multiple myeloma. Um, serum and urine protein electrophoresis, serum free light chains, and total immunoglobulin measurements are important in the diagnosis, monitoring, and prognostication of monoclonal gammopathies. There are several clinical guidelines related to monoclonal gammopathies, and those provide routine laboratories with guidance as to the appropriate testing required. They usually have strict cutoffs, either absolute value or percentage change for the diagnosis and monitoring of monoclonal gammopathies. However, these um, clinical guidelines make little mention of laboratory issues, um, such as which analytical methods to use, the best approach to quantification of monoclonal protein, know how to report results. There are several important clinical guidelines related to these disorders. These are a few of them. Um, I won't go through these individual guidelines, uh, but it is important to know about these guidelines for better understanding of laboratory requirements um, related to electrophoresis reporting. International Myeloma Working Group published updated criteria for diagnosis of multiple myeloma in 2014. You can find this. Um, guideline in Lancet Oncology um, this issue. As you can see, we have absolute value-based cutoffs to diagnose different monoclonal gammopathies. So correct quantification of monoclonal protein is important. It also included other laboratory features related to the diagnosis. It is important to know these criteria for um, interpretation and reporting of electrophoresis. Um, the International Myeloma Working Group has percentage change and absolute value-based criteria for response assessment and disease re relapse. Um, as you can see, there are percentage changes like more than 90% reduction, and then they have um, other criteria like we have to report whether it is detectable only by immunofixation or not. 
So um, it is important to know these um, criteria. Otherwise, even if you do immunofixation during electrophoresis, you may not report it in your report. So back to protein electrophoresis. Since we usually do not provide an image of the electrophoresis to the clinician, the sole means of communication is through our written report. Therefore, our uh, protein electrophoresis reports are extremely important for proper diagnosis and management of patients. So what do we see in the lab? As you can see, based on your um, technique, we can see different fractions um, and if there are any abnormalities related to these fraction we could see those whether there's a, a monoclonal protein or not and if present what's the location for this example it's in the gamma region um, and we can also determine the type of the monoclonal protein uh, using immunofixation or immunosubtraction we can also identify other features like polyclonal background, multiple bands, or immune paralysis. When we quantitate the monoclonal protein, we know how we quantitate it. But clinicians only see our reports. The electrophoresis could be different between laboratories. Some report all the fractions, including total immunoglobulins, others could um be only a comment describing the um, monoclonal protein clinicians won't know the location of the band or if there's immune paralysis or polyclonal background or even if we perform immunofixation unless we state that in the report but those information may be essential for the management of patients Therefore, it is extremely important to mention all the relevant information in our reports. What information should labs include when reporting electrophoresis? The most common and perhaps the most important rationale for performing electrophoresis is to detect monoclonal proteins. Therefore, the clinicians are primarily interested in if a monoclonal protein is present or not and if present the isotype and the concentration. The location is also important, especially if it is co-migrating in beta or alpha region. Given the role of uh, protein electrophoresis in monitoring of monoclonal gammopathies, the ability to weave a cumulative report is also important. It's also essential to provide necessary information to enable assessment of response to treatment. As I mentioned before, for example, negative immunofixation may be important um, information. In patients with post-transplant or post-monoclonal antibody treatment, it is important to differentiate those oligoclonal bands or small bands from previously reported um, monoclonal protein. I will come back to that in later. And consistent reporting is also important to prevent misinterpretation of results, especially during monitoring. If patients go to different labs during the course of the disease, comparison of results could be difficult due to variation between labs. To deliver clear information to the clinicians, um, to assist them in the management of their patients, you need to have a good understanding of the test and clinical requirements. To achieve this, we should know the basics related to our electrophoresis method. If you use gel electrophoresis, you should know the um, details of that method, similarly capillary zone electrophoresis. We should know normal proteins in different zones, causes of any abnormalities in um, these zones, um, possible interferences, and unusual patterns. We also should have a clear understanding of clinical requirements. During interpretation and reporting, use all the information available to you. Um, that includes patients' clinical details, including medication, other relevant laboratory findings. Um, those in information may help us to decide 
on further testing, including uh, immunofixation, or if you need to do further um, serum free light chains or something like that. Um, don't just look at the gel or capillarison tracing and just focus on that one. When you encounter an unusual pattern, always contact the clinician and correlate your findings with the clinical question being asked. Do we have any laboratory guidelines related to monoclonal gammopathy testing? There are a few available at the moment. Um, 2012 Australian and New Zealand recommendation is one of the main guidelines, guidelines in this area. There was, um, this was published in 2012 in the Annals of Clinical Biochemistry and um, proposed addendum to that um, recommendation was published in 2019 in Clean Biochem Reviews. Canadian Working Group also published candidate recommendations in 2018 and um, American College of Pathologies guidelines on laboratory workup and initial diagnosis of monoclonal gammopathy will be released real soon. So I hope you are familiar with these figures. If you use gel electrophoresis in your lab, um, you must be familiar with this figure. And if you use capillary zone electrophoresis, you should be um, familiar with this figure. The proteins are identified by um, serum protein electrophoresis can be divided into five or six main bands or peaks, depending on the methodology employed. If you use high resolution gel or capillary zone electrophoresis, you can identify six bands or peaks as shown in these figures, namely albumin alpha one, alpha two, beta one, beta two, and gamma. Um, you may not be able to differentiate beta-1 and beta-2 if you use low-resolution gel. It is important to know the main proteins in each of these areas to correct interpretation. As you can see, albumin is the main band. Sometimes we can see prealbumin or call it as transthyretin as a small slide diffuse band just an order to the um, albumin. You can see it here. Alpha-1 um, antitrypsin, alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, and alpha-1 antimicrotrypsin um, are the main um, proteins in alpha-1 region. Um, alpha-2 macroglobulin and haptoglobulin are the main ones in alpha-2 region. Transferrin is the main protein in beta-1 and C3 complement is the main protein in beta 2 um, region. We can see immunoglobulins in gamma. The commonest area for monoclonal gammopathies is gamma region followed by beta, but rarely you can see monoclonal proteins, especially free light chains, even in alpha 1 region. How do you identify or confirm a monoclonal protein? We can use gel-based immunofixation or capillary zone-based um, immunosubtraction. The gel-based immunofixation is the commonest method and required to confirm, it is required to confirm the um, complete response as per current clinical guidelines. Using immunofixation as the gold standard, um, various publications have compared the sensitivity and specificity of immunofixation and immunosubtraction. Immunosubtraction is an automated process and less time consuming, so it could be useful in a BC lab as an initial um, testing method. In general, immunosubtraction is more subjective, maybe due to inadequate familiarity, and you could miss um, light chains and common ones like IgD, IgE, malomas, or small bands. It may be useful in co-migrating bands or when there are multiple peaks. So some labs, they use both um, for difficult cases. When should we do immunofixation or immunosubtraction? 
if you have a patient during the first presentation, if there's abnormal band or peak is observed or suspected, you have to do immunofixation. Um, if there is an abnormal electrophoretic curve or isolated hypogamma globulinemia or any clinical or other laboratory findings suggestive of monoclonal gammopathies, then better to do immunofixation. During subsequent presentations, um, in patients with previous monoclonal protein, you don't have to repeat it in every visit. We should do immunofixation if there's a change in electrophoretic mobility or if the previously reported um, monoclonal protein is no longer visible or um, if there's a new band, we have to do um, immunofixation. In patients without previous monoclonal protein, appearance of a new band, obviously you need to fix it. And any significant change in electrophoretic curve may be better to do immunofixation. And any change in clinical condition may indicate the necessity of immunofixation. And also it is important to state if we have done immunofixation or not in the report. During immunofixation, typically um, five lanes are run separately and fixed using monospecific antisera against um, GAM heavy chains and against kappa and lambda light chains. So that is the usual um, immunofixation. However, sometimes we may need a second immunofixation, including um, anti-D and anti-E antisera, um, especially when we detect an isolated kappa or lambda band uh, without anti-GAM reactivity. Uh, for example, this particular patient, we had um, light chain reactivity with lambda, but no similar bands in GAM. And then we performed a repeat fix using D, E, and free lambda. And you can see the big band in D. So it's a patient with um, IgD myeloma. We can use immunosubtraction technique to identify monoclonal proteins on capillary zone in electrophoresis. This is a fully automated process, and patient serum is. Um, mixed with anti sera for G, A, M, kappa, and lambda. And when the antigen-antibody antigen, antigen complex is formed, it migrates towards the anode, and the peak disappears. Um, the monoclonal peak is identified when the peak disappears with a given antibody against the heavy chain and the light chain. In this example, you can see in the reference curve, um, you can see a clear monoclonal um, band in the gamma region. And when we um, did the um, immunosubtraction in this IgG column, you can see the disappearance of that band with um, IgG antisera. And also you can see the disappearance of that band with kappa antisera. So you could identify this band as monoclonal IgG kappa. So we will go through a um, few common patterns and possible interpretative comments. Depending on your report format and clinical query, commenting may be different for the normal pattern. It is useful to comment on the absence of monoclonal protein and whether you have performed the immunofixation when you comment on normal pattern. For example, um, you can comment as normal pattern, no immuno monoclonal protein detected by immunofixation. You could suggest further testing such as urine protein electrophoresis and serum free light chains if clinically indicated and if not already done. Sometimes you can see two albumin peaks um, slightly, with slightly different electrophoretic mobilities. This is referred to as bisalbuminemia. It may be hereditary or acquired. 
most hereditary variants have no pathological effect. Um, acquired beast albuminemia is usually due to the binding of exogenous molecules, such as antibiotics to albumin, and they are usually transient. Most individuals with this albuminemia have normal serum concentrations of albumin. Because of that, some people um, tend to ignore this albuminemia. If you want to comment on it, you could. Um, alpha-1 antitrypsin is a major protein in alpha-1 region, and it is a member of family of protease inhibitors called serpenes that inhibits proteolytic enzymes. People with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency can result in lung and liver diseases, and clinical presentation may vary depending on the phenotype, patient, and environmental factors. Um, as serum protein electrophoresis does not differentiate between alpha-1 antitrypsin and other minor proteins in the alpha-1 fraction, it is not confirmatory for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, you could measure alpha-1 antitrypsin concentration using immunochemical methods and phenotype and genotype could be used for definitive diagnosis. Sometimes some um, phenotypes can be seen as two small peaks in the alpha-1 region. So if you see a clear reduction in alpha-1 region like this, um, in this capillary zone electrophoresis, so like this in this um, agarose gel electrophoresis, it is um, important to state that in the report. And you could suggest alpha-1 antitrypsin quantitation and genotyping and phenotyping if clinically indicated. Serum protein electrophoresis pattern showing acute phase reaction is not uncommon, especially um, in hospital patients. Acute systemic inflammation triggers changes in the hepatic production of multiple serum proteins. The production of number of proteins located in alpha-1 and alpha-2 fractions, including alpha-1 antitrypsin, um, alpha-1 acid glycoprotein haptoglobin can increase during um, acute inflammation. You um, may find other relevant laboratory findings in these patients, such as high CRP levels. It is useful to state um, acute phase reaction in the report. If you are querying any underlying monoclonal protein, you could either do immunofixation or you could suggest to repeat serum protein electrophoresis when acute phase has resolved. Move on to beta-1 region. Transferrin is the main protein in the beta-1 region. It is increased in iron deficiency anemia. Other causes of increased beta-1 could be are the presence of free hemoglobin or some contrast agents, especially if you are using capillary zone um, electrophoresis. Sometimes monoclonal proteins can be seen in beta-1 region, especially RGAs and free light chains. Therefore, immunofixation is um, useful to exclude those um, monoclonal proteins. If immunofl immunofixation is normal and iron studies has not been done, it is useful to suggest iron studies. An increase between the beta and gamma regions, also known as beta-gamma bridging, usually suggests an increase in IgA and rarely IgM. As you can see in this, you can't clearly demarcate um, beta and gamma. Similar here. An odal slurring of albumin as shown in this figure B may occur secondary to binding of excess bilirubin or rarely other negatively charged drugs such as penicillin to albumin. So anodyl um, albumin slurring and beta gamma bridging are electrophoretic patterns commonly seen in patients with cirrhosis. So if you see this pattern, it would be useful to look at the liver function test 
rather than just blindly commenting on um, cirrhosis. Um, in nephrotic syndrome, uh, patients lose large amount of proteins in urine. So um, this then leads to reactive hepatic protein synthesis, including lipoproteins. You can see low serum albumin and gamma globulins in these patients with increase in high molecular weight proteins such as alpha-2 macroglobulin. Increased alpha-2 can be mistaken for a monoclonal protein. Sometimes you can see a broad diffuse increase in gamma region like this or that. Um, this is usually a result of a polyclonal plasma cell response to chronic antigenic stimulation. This can be seen in infection, inflammation, or autoimmune diseases. Sometimes dense polyclonal hypergamma globulinemia may be mistaken for a large monoclonal protein. You can miss small monoclonal proteins in um, this polyclonal background. It is important to perform immunofixation to exclude um, the presence of monoclonal proteins. What do you think about this serum protein electrophoresis? On um, agarose gel system compared to normal, you can't see any gamma um, globulins here. Similarly, on the capillary electrophoresis, gamma region is really low. Um, low gamma globulins can be seen in several clinical conditions. It could be part of um, renal or GI protein loss where you can see abnormalities in other regions. Isolated hypo hypogamma globulinemia may be due to primary immunodeficiency or acquired due to suppression by a neoplasm or medication. It is important to do or suggest immunofixation, free light chain analysis, and urine protein electrophoresis, as sometimes this may be due to monoclonal chemopathy, especially light chain multiple myeloma. Um, the term oligoclonal bands refers to two or more bands of gamma mobility on protein electrophoresis. These are commonly seen in autoimmune diseases, infections, some lymphoproliferative diseases, and um, post-stem cell transplant. It is important to differentiate oligoclonal bands from the small, um, from small monoclonal bands. Sometimes it is difficult and other techniques such as isoelectric focusing may be useful. Sometimes we could see abnormal bands due to interfering substances. Um, presence of fibrinogen in the sample could appear as a small band or peak in the beta gamma region. What is fibrinogen? Fibrinogen is a substrate for thrombin and it cleaved into fibrin to form the clot in the final step of coagulation cascade. It is not normally present in properly processed serum specimens, but we could see it rarely if we use plasma sample or in patients who are on anticoagulation therapy, in patients with coagulation disorders, or sometimes with serum samples if um, serum samples with insufficient clotting. How do we confirm? Um, to confirm this unusual band, you could do immunofixation, uh, which should be negative if it is due to fibrinogen, and some use thrombine. It usually disappears when electrophoresis is repeated after treatment with thrombine. If we use a hemolyzed sample, hemoglobin, haptoglobin complex um, can be seen in alpha 2 beta region. So you should be able to identify hemolyzed samples. Rarely you could see abnormal peaks or distortions, especially in alpha 2 and beta 2 um, areas with capillary zone electrophoresis due to contrast media. Um, immunofixation or repeat sample can be used to exclude or confirm monoclonal proteins in these situations. 
So as with any other laboratory test, interferences can occur with the electrophoresis. The awareness of, awareness of these interferences is important. Often usual practices such as immunofixation will resource most of these interferences. Some may need clear comments or communication with clinicians to avoid misdiagnosis and management of patients. The best example is monoclonal antibody therapies. I will come to that later. Once we identify the monoclonal protein, it is important to quantitate it correctly. The monoclonal protein can be quanti quantified from serum protein electrophoresis or using immunochemical methods. There are many variations and limitations in quantification of monoclonal proteins. Laboratories use different gating methods such as perpendicular drop or corrected perpendicular drop or tangent scheming to quantitate monoclonal proteins. Figure A shows standard perpendicular drop method. The demarcation begins um, where the monoclonal spike meets the polyclonal region below it and then proceeds straight down to the baseline, including all the area above and below. For this particular example, using perpendicular drop, it measures 15 grams per liter. Figure B um, shows corrected perpendicular drop method where an attempt is made to narrow the area um, measured to compensate for uh, the inclusion of the polyclonal area below. The same M spike here measures 12 grams per liter. Figure C is tangent skimming method. This method um, attempts to cut off only the area above the peak. So the same monoclonal protein now measures 10 grams per liter. As you can see, depending on the gating method, the reported monoclonal protein concentration could vary significantly. In the absence of reference method to know the exact peak concentration, it is difficult to determine the accuracy of these gating methods. Perpendicular drop method can be affected by underlying polyclonal immunoglobulins. So um, in patients with underlying polyclonal um, increase, it could overestimate the monoclonal protein, especially for small bands. Corrected perpendicular method is subjective and it could result in variation between operators. Tangent skimming may not work well in um, some cases, especially non-gamma regions, and could underestimate monoclonal proteins. A recent report published in um, the Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine Journal using daratumumab and elotizumab mimicking low concentration IgG kappa monoclonal protein um, concentration between 0.1 to 10 grams per liter showed the differences between perpendicular drop and uh, tangent scheming. The differences were more prominent in hypergamma globulinemia um, and especially in low concentrations of monoclonal proteins um, less than 10 grams per liter. These studies suggest that although the measurement of monoclonal protein is overestimated with perpendicular drop and underestimated with tangent skimming, the measurement is still helpful to follow trends in patients if we use the same method and laboratory. If we use tangent skimming um, at diagnosis and then perpendicular drop next time, then you won't be able to compare um, to results. How should we report a monoclonal protein in gamma region? Um, this is the commonest location for monoclonal protein. When you detect a monoclonal protein on serum protein electrophoresis, you have to do immunofixation to identify the band. So this band, um, as you can see with the immunofixation, is IgG kappa band. Um, 
And you can clearly see the immune paresis, the other normal globulins are really low. We can't see it here. So how should we report this? We should state clearly um, that there's a monoclonal protein and the type and concentration and location. And then we could comment on presence of immune paresis. And if this is a known patient, um, we have to compare it with the previous episode. This is an example report of that um, serum protein electrophoresis. This lab um, reports all the fractions as well as total immunoglobulin concentrations. They state the presence of monoclonal protein and then the type and the concentration. Under the comment, they mention the location of the band as well as presence of immune paresis. Um, if this is a second visit, they may not state the um, location again because you can see the previous comment unless it's changed but um, they still comment on immune paresis. And cumulative report, as you can see, is very um, easy for doctors. They can clearly compare the previous results with the um, current results. Um, even if you don't use cumulative reporting, it is essential to check the previous electrophoresis and records. Otherwise, you won't be able to comment whether this is the same monoclonal protein or not. If um, previously reported monoclonal protein is not detectable, now you have to mention that in the comment. Quantification of monoclonal proteins migrating in alpha or beta region is challenging. This is one of the areas with significant variation between labs. In the beta region, monoclonal proteins may be obscured by varying concentrations of um, complement C3 or transferrin. This mainly affects IgA monoclonal proteins. Approximately 40% of IgAs migrate in the beta region, but up to 25% of all monoclonal proteins may migrate in the beta region or beta gamma margin. Both densitometric monoclonal protein and immunochemical total immunoglobulin measurements have limitations. Densitometry measures both the monoclonal protein and the co-migrating proteins. So low-level monoclonal protein may not reliably measure using this, but useful for large bands. Immunochemical methods measure both the monoclonal and polyclonal immunoglobulins of that isotype. It may overestimate immunoglobulin values at higher concentrations um, because of nonlinearity. This is a patient with IgA kappa multiple myeloma on treatment. This patient moved between labs during treatment, which is not uncommon in some areas, especially in um, Victoria. In January, um, Lab X reported the IgA kappa concentration as four grams per liter. A month later, Lab Y reported um, IgA kappa as 12 grams per liter. But sorry, based on the command that includes monoclonal protein plus normal beta proteins of around seven grams per liter. Lab Y also reported total IgA concentration, which was five grams per liter. So how do you interpret this result? We don't have adequate information in Lab X report to determine even if the band was in beta region. If so, the method of quantification. Uh, this four grams per liter could be um, total IgA value or the value of so subtracting a fixed value for normal beta proteins, or it could be total beta plus para protein. If this is total beta plus para protein, um, the patient's 
value increase from 4 to 12 because lab Y use total beta plus para protein um, when they report it. Um, so that this indicates the importance of providing adequate information on SPEP reports. Otherwise, clinicians can't compare these four grams per liter with the 12 grams per liter the next month. Based on several published studies and surveys during last few years, there is a significant between laboratory variation in measurement of beta migrating um, monoclonal proteins. Treating clinicians may not be aware of these differences, and this could potentially affect patient management when a patient being monitored for um, treatment response. There are several reasons for this variability. It could be due to um, different analytical te um, techniques, capillary zone versus agarose gel electrophoresis, or it may be due to differences um, different laboratory practices in quantification and reporting of beta migrating um, monoclonal proteins. Um, clinical guidelines suggested total immunoglobulin measurement, especially for patients with IgA myeloma for monitoring purposes. Based on um, previous studies, between the lab variation is low compared to serum protein electrophoresis for total immunoglobulins but most labs do not routinely report total immunoglobulins as part of the um, protein electrophoresis report. As I mentioned before, this variation could be related to analytical method in some patients. The migration could be different between agarose gel electrophoresis and capillary zone electrophoresis in some patients. This example is from the sample exchange performed in 2018. And the band was in the beta 1 region using capillary zone electrophoresis and beta 2 using agarose gel electrophoresis. They also, those four labs also use different um, gating methods. The impact of method specific differences was small compared to gating methodology. As you can see in the table, um, both lab A and B used capillary zone electrophoresis, but lab A used perpendicular drop and B used corrected perpendicular drop. So um, lab A reported it as eight grams and B reported it as four grams per liter. This example is from the QAP survey conducted in 2020. Different quantification techniques can give significantly different results even if we use the same method. We analyzed that QAP sample using capillary zone electrophoresis and used different quantification methods as stated by participants. The IgA kappa level was 16 grams per liter using total beta plus para protein method. Um, it was 12 grams per liter if we used beta 2 plus para protein and 10 grams per liter if we use corrected perpendicular method. And um, using tangent skimming, the concentration is only six grams per liter. We measured total IgA concentration on the sample and that was 14 grams per liter. So even using the same analytical technique, capillary zone electrophoresis, the results could vary between five to 16 grams depending on your quantification methods. So at the moment, we don't have a gold standard method to measure these co-migrating monoclonal proteins accurately. 2012 recommendations suggested to report total beta plus para protein, mainly to reduce the interlab variation during patient monitoring. It also supports the reporting of total immunoglobulin by immunochemical methods to facilitate disease monitoring. Reporting of total immunoglobulin, especially IgA, is also recommended in clinical guidelines. It has less lab between lab variation, but um, based on recent um, survey, only 25% of labs in Australia currently report total immunoglobulin as part of the routine um, SPEP report. 
As a minimum, it is important to include a clear command identifying the monoclonal protein is in the beta region and the method of quantification that may help clinicians during monitoring. Reporting of small band is another area of um, confusion. Small abnormal bands can be seen on electrophoresis in two circumstances, in patients without a known monoclonal protein or in patients with a known monoclonal protein, especially after stem cell transplant or monoclonal antibody therapy. First presentation of us. Uh, with me when I, uh, when, when I had to take enzymes, so then uh, uh, group my message here. First presentation of small bands could represent important diseases such as lymphoma, AL amyloidosis, oligosecretary myeloma, or monoclonal chemopathy of renal significance. It is important not to miss these diagnoses. However, small bands, usually around one gram per liter, are a common occurrence on um, electrophoresis due to inflammatory infectious autoimmune processes, in which case they are often transient. Overcalling these small bands can precipitate, cas precipitate a cascade of um, unnecessary investigations. The other situation is appearance of uh, small bands in patients with multiple, multiple myeloma after stem, stem cell transplant. These small bands are typically IgG, kappa, and often less than or equal to one gram per liter. These may persist um, for one to 18 months, this can be mistakenly reported to suggest relapsed myeloma. In most of those cases, these are mainly due to transient dysregulation of the um, regenerating beta cell compartment during hematopoietic recovery and usually associated with improved remission depth and outcome. To prevent misinterpretation of these bands, it is important to identify and report the presence or absence of original monoclonal protein. Um, and we should differentiate oligoclonal bands from small monoclonal bands. If there's a new band which is different to the original monoclonal protein, we must state that clearly in the report. There are few therapeutic monoclonal antibodies in use in some centers to treat multiple myeloma patients. Commonest one is daratumumab, and this can be seen as a small monoclonal IgG kappa band on serum protein electrophoresis and specifically immune fixation. They typically present in trays or up to one gram per liter, um, and it is important to identify these bands to prevent misinterpretation and mismanagement. Different, um, there are the monoclonal antibody therapies available like elotizumab and nasotizumab. And these um, different agents, um, um, they have different migration pattern. So it is important to know the position of common monoclonal antibodies in your um, hospital or area on SPEP um, system. These are two patients treated with, um, treated with daratumumab. Um, before the treatment, you can see the uh, monoclonal IgA lambda in patient number one and IgA kappa in patient number two. During therapy, um, in both patients, the original para protein level um, bands decrease, but you can see the appearance of new IgG kappa band um, in the usual position similar to daratumumab. And this is another patient treated with elotizumab. Pre-treatment, you can see um, IgG lambda band. During therapy, the original band is still there, but you can see the um, new um, G kappa band, typical um, at the usual position of elotizumab. It is important to identify this band during reporting. If you query the presence of monoclonal antibodies, the easiest way would be to check with the clinicians. Um, it is also important to include an appropriate comment um, for these patients.
this is an example comment. We usually use this when we suspect or know that patient is on one of these agents. Um, these are a uh, few suggested comments for a small band which was published in um, Clean Bark and Reviewed um, in 2019. I might stop at this stage because I won't be able to finish the um, cases today. Any questions? Well, um, firstly, I want to, to thank uh, uh, Dr. Richard Ratney so much for this wonderful presentation. I think very detailed and very interesting. We do have a couple of questions on the chat. Um, let me see. There were some early questions if I've recorded. Uh, there was one question about um, which is best for primary amyloidosis diagnosis. Uh, but maybe it was on light chain monoclonal poly. Okay, sorry. How much light chain assay, monoclonal polyclonal instruments like Optilite, Siemens, BM Prospect? What is best for primary amyloidosis diagnosis? What is best um, for primary you... amyloidosis? Yeah. Usually, um, patients with primary amyloidosis, um, we won't detect it using it serum protein electrophoresis or the immunofixation. So it is useful to measure serum free light chain and urine protein electrophoresis. Um, was that question related to different methods? Mm. May yeah, maybe this, this question would be best handled in the follow-up lecture, which I... Which I uh... I'm not sure whether they were referring because um, the original um, guidelines... Yeah, I'm not sure what that Question. Yeah, probably this question more, <laughs> yes, maybe more mm. relevant for free light chain uh, as, uh, lecture that, that we'll invite you back for yeah. in November. All right. So um, there was also a follow-up question from the same um, participant about the methods for measuring area under the peak, which I think you've already covered. Um, just wondering, uh, just based on that, you did cover a few different methods and um, just you know, and they all have different uh, advantages and, and maybe some disadvantages. I'm just curious, what which one do you use in your institution and why? Um, between perpendicular drop and tangent scheming. Yes. We, uh, we use perpendicular drop, and um, during our previous few um, surveys, um, um, so uh, based on um, Australian and New Zealand surveys and international surveys, most of the labs um, use perpendicular drop. And um, French Maloma group, they suggested perpendicular drop as well. Um, I think one reason could be because majority, even here around 70% of labs use perpendicular drop for the consistency it would be easier to go with the common method because we don't have a gold standard. So both methods got um, um, advantages and disadvantages. As um, you saw in my slide based on that um, study, even tangent skimming could um, underestimate paraproteins. So both methods got problems. And for the consistency and monitoring purposes, it's important to use the same method. Because of that, um, in our proposed um, addendum, we suggested a perpendicular drop, um, mainly because of the um, number of labs who already use that method. It's very hard to change 70% of labs to different methods unless it is a gold standard. I see. Thank you for sharing. Um, and also, uh, we have more questions in the chat room. Uh, let me go on to the next one. Uh, in serum protein electrophoresis, we report monoclonal protein, anything less than uh, one gram per liter as less than one gram per liter. Uh, is this the same for urine protein electrophoresis also? Um, 
we report less than one gram per liter as less than one gram per liter for serum, but we have lower cutoff for urines. Usually urines we are talking about in milligrams per liter. So when we um, convert that to grams, I think um, we report um, less than 0 0.01 gram per liter. It is Distance. definitely different in um, urine. Right. Urine electrophoresis is very variable between labs. Some they don't concentrate, some they do concentrate before the um, electrophoresis, so that could affect your results as well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, on what equations do we use fluidyl or beta mercaptor -ethanol? Um, In our lab, we use BME, but uh, as suggested by Sebion, um, that BME um, reagent is uh, BME plus fluidy, so it, it's a mix. Um, I think there were a few publications comparing only BME and fluidy as well, but the CBI recommended method I think got both um, BME and fluidy in it. I know some labs use um, DTT as a re reducing agent as well, but we usually use BME prepared in fluidy. Let's see, and that's in all cases. Sorry? Uh, because the question is, on what occasions do we use this? Um, uh, we use um, that is especially for um, IgM um, paraproteins. I got those slides, so that was my next session, but um, it's too um, long, so I didn't go into details of that one. Mm -hmm. So okay. I have a um, I have several slides on specifically um, problems related to IgM paraprotein, which includes how to reduce those effects and BME treatment is one of the um one of the answers for that one. So I have a few cases for IgM paraproteins. We'll do it next time. I see. Uh, that's great. So we'll keep that in view for the next lecture as well. Yeah. Um the next question also, um, when do we use free light chain in immunofixation electrophoresis? When do we use? Yeah, I'm not sure. I think maybe it's like maybe when do we add free light chain as a test? Um, I'm not sure if they were querying free kappa and lambda anti sera during um immunofixation. Mm. Uh, like um this example. Can you see my slide in a yes. yes. So this one because we detected lambda reactivity with our GAM when we repeated um, our fixation with D and E, we also included free lambda antisera. So free lambda and free kappa antisera is available. So usually for fixation, we use GAM and kappa and lambda, but you can, uh, free kappa and free lambda um, antisera is available. So in these sort of situations, we sometimes use free, um, lambda or free kappa just to confirm that as a free um, light chain, not light chain um, bound to um, heavy chain. I see. Is it possible I'm to go sure on whether a, that a question is related to that? Yeah, probably. Um, is it possible to go on slideshow for this? The the edit mode somehow, uh, this, this slide is going up and down in terms of the size. This one. Oh, yes, perfect. I see. So um, sometimes we, I mean, this is one of the instances, and sometimes when we see co-migrating, um, um, for example, IgG kappa and free kappa or something, especially if we see a very high um, serum free light chain results, but we can't see it on the immunofixation because it could be co-migrating with the main Para protein, then we would do a second fix using free kappa or free lambda, just to make sure we don't see it. 
I see. Actually, I do have a follow-on question on that. I was just wondering, uh, for free light chains themselves, where would you expect them typically to migrate on the SP? Free light chain, um, I I have seen uh, free light chains even in a horn region. Oh. Um, so I I included that one. I'll show it because I've got that slide here. So this one, this was one of our recent patients. So um, patient got lambda free life chain, but as you can see, it's in the alpha one region. Very easy to miss. Not easy to miss, but um, if you haven't done the immunofixation, you could clearly miss it. I see. So it really could be migrating almost anywhere? Um, this is rare, but it could happen. I haven't seen anything in the albumin peak yet, so hope not. But um, al right. even alpha one is rare. This is not a common one. Alpha two, not that uncommon, but beta region is commoner than that. Um, this one, I mean, if you haven't done urine uh, or serum free light chain or immunofixation, you may not be able to detect it. Great. And the following question was, uh, do we need to report the quantity of the small band? If it is less than one gram, I won't report because um, it, it depends on how do you define small band. If it is less than one, we won't report it. Um, it depends on the situation, as I said, um, um, like if it is a first presentation and those very small bands, you have to be careful uh, whether that's part of oligoclonal banding pattern or monoclonal protein. Um, unless you do as electric focusing, it may not be that clear, but anything less than one gram we don't report. Um, it is sometimes important to um, state the uncertainty um, in your report, like in this suggested comment. This presentation of small abnormal band in a polyclonal or oligoclonal background. You can mention the approximation of the quantity, like approximately one gram per liter, but I mean, especially first presentation in a patient who didn't have a paraprotein before, we don't know the clinical significance. So we, we usually include something like that. It's clinical significance, it's uncertain. So sometimes we do see these small um, bands um, due to inflammatory or reactive process and after a few months, they just disappear. I see. All right, thank you. I don't see any further questions on the chat, but uh, if anyone else uh, would like to ask a question but uh, I could not access the chat, please feel free to unmute. Um, but in the meantime, I'll just uh, make a, uh, you know, a promotion for the next, uh, the next few sessions. So we'll have uh, um, in September polypyria and uh, October will be, um, I think it's tumor markers. And November, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, Dr. Vijaratne back again for free light chain and, uh, you know, some of the more unusual cases of, uh, of serum protein electrophoresis. So uh, stay tuned for, for those invites. And of course, our feedback form, uh, which you should be getting a link to as well in order to get your certificate of attendance.